All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so today, um, I wanted to start off by reminding you, if you hadn't seen the announcement yet, I did postpone exam two until next Wednesday. I was stressing out, and I felt like if I was stressing out, you all were stressing out. <laughs> so uh, I don't want anyone to be stressed, and um, so we're going to slow it down a little bit, and hopefully we'll have enough time for a fun game on Monday, okay, so that we can review. Um, also, don't forget that we do have a review session on Friday afternoon. I did reserve this room. I'll make an announcement today. This room, uh, 1.30 to 3.30 on Friday afternoon, 1.30 to 3.30. Um, again, we're in this room. Um, so I highly encourage you all to come. If you can't make it because you have a class, uh, I will record the session. There is already a review session online, if you haven't noticed that, as well as the, in the study uh, guide for exam two from last semester. So you can take a look at that already. That will really help you, I think, with your studies this weekend. We'll review, we'll finish up and review a little bit on Monday, and then we're going to take the test on Wednesday. Okay, good? Okay, so today what we're going to do is um, we're going to talk about how. We're going to revisit the autonomic nervous system, talk about the sympathetic and parasympathetic and how that controls heart rate. So that's where we'll end up with the um, electrophysiology. And then we'll start with the heart is the pump and talk about something called the Wiggers diagram. So to start off, uh, we will have a top hat question later on today. Um, I think we're going to have enough time for it after we get through the Wiggers diagram. Uh, first, I'm going to start off with the document camera. Again, I'm recording the session, so I apologize for people that are at home when they're watching this that this is on the document camera. I'll keep, they'll be able to see this figure, but they won't be able to see me drawing today. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, how the autonomic nervous system controls cardiac pacing. So as we've talked about before, remember, um, Heart rate, the heart rate uh, is really endemic, it, endogenous to the muscle itself, and it's controlled by those pacemaker cells of the SA note. So if you take the heart out of someone's body and you put it in a box, we've talked about that, it will still continue to beat without any neuronal control or hormonal control. Uh, so it has this intrinsic heart rate associated with it. But there are nerves that are innervating the SA node that can speed up the heart rate or slow down the heart rate. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. I really like this part of the lecture because it brings a lot of things that you already know about from this class into play. Okay, so here we are at the document camera. I am going to draw a heart here. You can follow along. We've got our four chambers, the two atria and two, the two ventricles, and the SA node, okay? So what we're talking about today are the autonomic nervous system. These are neurons that innervate the SA node, okay? And this can control the heart rate. It can speed up the heart rate or slow down the heart rate. So if I blow this up, I'm going to draw a box around the SA node and that uh, we're going to start off with the sympathetic neuron. So you get an increase in sympathetic tone and those sympathetic neurons are activated. Uh, here's what we're looking at, right? We've got the sympathetic neuron here and one cell of the SA node. I'll just represent that here. Okay, and I'll, I'll write that down here. This is called the sympathetic neuron or the sympathetic nervous system, SNS. All right, so here's, I do want you to know the details on this. The neurotransmitter that's released from those neuro, uh, neurons are called 
nor epinephrine. Nor epinephrine. It used to be called noradrenaline. So you can imagine when you get uh, adrenaline increases in your body, you're going to get a faster heart rate. Your respiratory rate is going to increase. The receptors at the SA node are the beta-1 adrenergic receptors. Beta-1 adrenergic receptors. All right. Guess what? These are metabotropic receptors that are G-protein coupled. These are typical GS coupled receptors. So, Going back in your memory, you remember the GS pathway, uh, GS alpha dissociates from the beta gamma, migrates over to adenylocyclase. Adenylocyclase is an enzyme that converts ATP to cyclic AMP. So you're going to get an increase in cyclic AMP within the cell. Now, we talked about the funny channels last time, funny channels that are expressed also on the plasma membrane. Funny channels. These are technically called the HCN channels. Okay, HCN channels. They are, again, hyperpolariz hyperpolarization. Cyclic nucleotide gated. Oop, I ran out of room here. Gated. Hyperpolarization cyclic nucleotide gated. It actually responds to the increase in cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP binds directly to those funny channels, or the HCN channels. And it increases their activity. So what happens is that action potential, if you remember this from last time, the action potential that you can record in one cell of the SA node has that eroding depolarization until it reaches threshold, and you get the opening of the voltage-gated calcium channels, repolarization, and then again that eroding depolarization. So that dotted line is threshold there. What happens with sympathetic nervous system stimulation is it increases phase four of that action potential waveform so that you get a faster depolarization, it reaches threshold faster, and it increases your heart rate. Right? This is a pretty easy lecture to give now because you know about the GS pathway. You know about the action potential waveform in the SA node. You get a increase in the slope of the phase four, reaching threshold faster, right, and increasing heart rate. So let's put some things together. If you increase heart rate, what's that going to do to cardiac output? Anybody remember that one? Maybe it's too early. You haven't studied. Remember that cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. So if you increase heart rate, you're going to increase cardiac output. What happens when you increase cardiac output? And total peripheral resistance stays the same. 
This is Ohm's law here. So when you increase cardiac output, assuming that the resistance stays the same, you're also going to increase blood pressure, mean arterial pressure. So you can see how things, now that you know the fundamentals, how things are interconnected. Okay? Pretty good. That's a lot of information right there, but I feel like you all have the foundation to really understand it. It's pretty cool. All right, so let's see here. Let's go with the parasympathetic. Parasympathetic. All right, the parasympathetic, we've got our same heart right here. SA node. The parasympathetic is also innervating cells of the SA node. Same, same idea here. Remember the nerves are in the, I'm gonna start kind of reviewing, the nerves are in the epicardium, the visceral, which is continuous with the visceral pericardium. Coronary arteries and nerves are in that area of the heart when you're looking at the layers of the heart wall. Okay, so this is the parasympathetic system. the resting and digesting arm of the autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system. And remember, this slows the heart rate profoundly, slows it. Bradycardia is another term we learned last time. So let's blow this up, this area. What we have here is cell of the SA, or um, yep, cell of the SA node. This is the parasympathetic. And these neurons release acetylcholine. Just like with the skeletal muscle, acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. It binds to now this is different, not the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the skeletal muscle. These are the muscarinic receptors. Or M2 receptors. So it makes sense that this is also a metabotropic receptor, G protein couple. Remember that's different from ionotropic, which is an ion channel. Metabotropic means it's G protein coupled. I'll write that down too, metabotropic. G protein coupled. So it makes sense that this receptor is GI coupled. GI coupled. The GI coupled receptor. So what's that going to do? It's going to decrease cyclic AMP in the cell. If you decrease cyclic AM AMP in the cell, it doesn't bind there's not enough cyclic AMP to really bind to those bunny channels. So it makes sense that the action potential waveform, instead of this phase four, phase zero, and then three, it actually decreases the slope of phase four. So it takes longer to reach threshold. Phase four. You get a decrease in the slope of phase four. Now it takes much longer to reach threshold and fire another action potential. 
slowing the heart rate. So they have antagonistic effects because these receptors either uh, couple to a GS coupled receptor or a GI coupled receptor. It's very elegant when you think about it. And that's controlling your heart rate, either speeding it up or slowing it down. And you know all of the different components to really understand this now. Okay, so one more thing that I just wanna mention is when we look at the parasympathetic nervous system, and if anyone wants to come up and take pictures of these after class too, you can totally do that. Um, all right, one last thing here. We've never really ascribed a role for the beta gamma subunits, okay? So if here's our receptor and our ligand is acetylcholine with the parasympathetic, we're still with the parasympathetic nervous system. Our ligand is acetylcholine. Remember we have the beta and gamma and the alpha subunit. Once the, our M2 receptor is activated, the beta gamma actually migrate over, I'm gonna go, we're gonna go in this direction, migrate over to a potassium channel. that will cause hyperpolarization. Potassium will flood, move out of the cell once it's activated by the beta gamma. So again, uh, the M2 receptor, acetylcholine binds to the receptor, it's activated. Alpha moves over to adenyl cyclase and inhibits it, decreasing cyclic AMP. But the beta gamma, they migrate over to a potassium channel called GERC. This is G protein coupled, you don't have to know this, inwardly rectifying potassium channel. And that tends to hyperpolarize the cell in the beginning of phase four. So instead of the action potential looking like this, phase four, Phase four, right? Not only do you get a decrease in the phase four slope, you also get a profound hyperpolarization in the beginning of phase four. So now it takes even longer, right, to fire another action potential. So you get a decrease in the slope of phase four, and you get this profound hyperpolarization in the beginning. It's called the acetylcholine current. Okay, so let's take a look at the slides. Now it's actually pretty easy to go through these slides. This is called the virtual cat. It's a computer simulation that if you actually add acetylcholine at the bottom here, you can see a profound decrease in heart rate, right? This is the parasympathetic response and blood pressure as we just talked about. If you actually add atropine, which is a blocker of the muscarinic receptors, you can see it recovers, right? Heart rate recovers and blood pressure recovers. If you add acetylcholine later on, you don't get any response because you've already, uh, they're desensitized to acetylcholine now. And then finally you add norepinephrine and you can see a profound increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Okay, so norepinephrine is working through the adrenergic receptors, the beta adrenergic receptors. 
Let's start with the sympathetic first. This slide just gives you some information. This is more pharmacology. Right now we're talking about the beta-1 adrenergic receptors. Agonists are molecules that activate that receptor. Antagonists are uh, molecules, uh, drugs that actually block the receptor. And remember, the beta-1 is a GS coupled and it increases cyclic AMP within the cell. So how many of you have a family member that has high blood pressure and actually is on medication for it? Maybe your parents, you, maybe your dad or your mom. So they may be taking a tenolol, right? A tenolol is blocking the beta adrenergic receptors. It helps to decrease heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, and mean arterial pressure. Helps to bring the blood pressure down. These are what's known as beta blockers. Maybe you've heard of that term before, beta blockers, right? Beta blockers are inhibiting the beta adrenergic receptors. Really great blood pressure medication. All right, so this slide is just showing you that cyclic AMP, these are the cyclic nucleotide binding domains in the C-terminal end of the funny channels, right? These are the funny channels. They bind directly to those channels to either increase their activity and increase that slope four of the action potential waveform, or if there's not a lot of cyclic AMP around, that will decrease the activity of the HCN channels, reducing the slope and taking a lot longer. So again, that GSGI pathway. Here's a nice slide that's really giving you some nice information, right? The blue line is normal heart rate, the blue line here, normal heart rate. With sympathetic stimulation, you can see in green, you get an increase in the slope of phase four and an increase in heart rate. With the parasympathetic, you can see the red line. First of all, you get a decrease in that phase four, that slope of phase four. It takes longer to reach threshold. And you actually get that hyperpolarization due to the GERC channels in the beginning of phase four. So now it takes a lot longer to reach threshold, that red line, and fire an action potential, slowing the heart tremendously. And if you need some text, here's some text actually associated with the regulation of heart rate and the physiological significance of those HCN channels regulated by cyclic AMP. This won't be on your exam, this particular explanation. It does shift the voltage sensitivity to more physiological ranges so that you have a greater number of channels open with an increase in cyclic AMP. All right, uh, here's the muscarinic receptors. This is the parasympathetic response. Agonists are acetylcholine, like we talked about, and an antagonist is atropine. So another agonist, um, you may have known this from maybe studying history in World War I, sarin gas, a nerve gas, is a muscarinic receptor agonist, and it causes blood, right? It's that secretions, lacrimations, tearing, urination, defecation, and it does actually have effects on the heart. And it was lethal at the time, sarin gas. Atropine was the cure, right? If you could get to a medic and they could give you atropine, that would really help with that uh, response. So these are the GI coupled receptors and they decrease cyclic AMP within the cell. All right, so that should, you can see that here, that red line is what's happening. Here's just an interesting animation. I'll go to Rome here. You already, I've already talked about this. This is what happens when our parasympathetic nerve terminal ends, releases acetylcholine, 
binds to the muscarinic receptor, alpha subunit should still be up uh, on the membrane. It's membrane bound. It goes to acetyl, um, adenyl cyclase, but it's the beta gamma subunit that open up this particular potassium channel called GERC. So it's, you know, just a nice little animation. Acetylcholine binds to the muscarinic receptors, beta gamma opens up that potassium channel, hyperpolarizing the cell in the beginning of phase four. So pretty good stuff. Um, and again, if you need some text, these are just review slides of everything that I've talked about. And this is a nice summary at the very end. It gives you some information about the sympathetic GS coupled, what the ligand is, and the sequence of events. So everything I just talked about is really summarized right here in this slide. All right, so let's go to heart as a pump. What happens after the electrical current sweeps through each of the cells? They contract. And just a little bit of a review up front here. Okay. So remember the action potentials occur first within each cell. Rapid depolarization, a plateau phase, this is the ventricular myocytes, and repolarization. The refractory period lasts as long as the contraction itself, so you don't get submation and tetanus. I'll blow this up a little bit. There we go. Some terms that we've already discussed. You already know the terms for systole and diastole. Two phases, systole is when the heart is completely contracted. It has an isovolumetric phase and an ejection phase. During the ejection phase, blood is forced out into the systemic circulation through to the aorta. Diastole is when the heart is re completely relaxed and the blood is entering into the heart. I'm not going to go through this slide yet. We're going to come back to it because it's going to make so much more sense after I go through what's known as the Wiggers diagram. This is giving you some idea of what's called the cardiac cycle, what's happening with every heartbeat. You have systole and diastole. This is telling you these red boxes. When the AV valves are open and closed, and when the semilunar valves are open and closed. Just so you know, both AV valves, the left and right AV valves, open and close at the same time. The aortic and semilunar, the aortic and pulmonary semilunar valves also open and close at the same time. Now, with these valves, you don't need any neurons neurogenic input. You don't need any hormones. These valves open and close merely by pressure changes in the, in the chambers. So when pressure changes in the chambers, these valves open and close. All right, so here's also a cardiac cycle and an animation. But I'm actually going to lecture about it with this diagram called the Wiggers diagram. It's actually named after a scientist. His name was Carl Wiggers, W-I-G-G-E-R-S, Carl Wiggers. And what he did is he documented and published uh, all of the sequence of events with it, with each heartbeat, with each cardiac cycle. The top panel here is the pressure changes in the atria, the ventricles, and the aorta. This one is concentrating just on the left-hand side, the left ventricle. This middle panel here in green are the volume changes in the left ventricle. This is the volume of blood. Then you have the heart sounds, lub-dub, 
lub dub, and it's all in sync with the pressure and volume changes. And here is the EKG. This is the electrocardiogram. Usually some people say ECG. Here in the United States we use a C, but this was developed uh, in Germany, and cardio is with a K. That's the difference. It's the same thing, but EKG is the same thing as ECG. All right, and then this tells you the ventricular diastole, systole, contraction, systole, diastole. So this will make sense. This is the cardiac cycle. This will make sense on the back end. So I put this on, right, I put this in a Word document so that I could blow it up a little bit. Okay. All right, so hopefully you can see this fairly clearly. Um, what I'm gonna do is start with the electrical current first, right? We're gonna start with that P wave. And we learned this last time, the P wave is atrial depolarization. This is when those action potentials go from cell to cell to cell through the gap junctions and sweep through the entire atria. Electrical current happens first, and then contraction of both atria. Okay, so we'll start with the P wave. Electrical current sweeps through first, then the atria start to contract. You can actually see, let's go back up here to the purple line here. This is the atria. That's the pressure in the atria. And essentially here, the green line is the pressure in the ventricles. So once the P wave sweeps through the atria, the both atria contract at the same time, you can see a little bit of a bump in the pressure in both atrium, the left atria and the ventricle, because it forces blood into the ventricle as well, so it bumps up the pressure in both the left atrium and the left ventricle. And you can see here, you get a little bit of a bump in the blood volume in the left ventricle, okay? All right, then we have the QRS wave. Now that electrical current first starts first, sweeps through the ventricles, and then the ventricles start to contract, all right? As soon as you can see, now we're looking at the green line here at, up at the top. As soon as the pressure in the left ventricle gets higher than or increases and is higher than the pressure in the left atrium, that's when the AV valve shuts. That's when that mitral valve shuts. Okay, as soon as the pressure in the left ventricle exceeds the pressure in the left atrium, that's when you're gonna get that left AV valve. Now, the same thing is happening in the right. So I'm gonna say this, both the AV valves shut at the same time, and that's your lub sound. When those valves shut, you can actually hear that with a stethoscope, lub. All right, so now the pressure in the ventricles, as the ve ventricles are contracting, the ventricle pressure is getting higher and higher. It's starting to really increase. Now, I want you to think about this. No blood is ble being ejected. The pressure, the muscles are contracting, but no blood is being forced out yet. This is technically an isovolumetric contraction. In other words, the muscle is contracting, but it's not allowed to shorten. What technically is this? When a muscle is contracting, but not allowed to shorten, is this isometric or isotonic? Yes, it is an isometric contraction. It's contracting, but no blood is being ejected. This is also known as an isovolumetric contraction. It's increasing the pressure inside, increasing, increasing, increase, but it's not until the pressure in the ventricle 
exceeds the pressure in the aorta, that's when the semilunar valves open. Both semilunar valves open at the same time, and now you get the rush of blood into the aorta. Right, that pushes the blood from the ventricle into the aorta. So this part of the Wigger's diagram is the ejection phase. All right, and you can see that with the volume here. You can see the volume of blood really decreases during the ejection phase. Not during, right, not during the isovolumetric phase. There's no change in blood volume. Pressure's rising, but there's no change in volume. It's not until the pressure in the ventricle exceeds the pressure in the aorta, that's when you get ejection, and you can see that volume of blood really decreases. So going back here, now you get the T wave, that's repolarization. Muscle starts to relax in the ventricle. You can actually see the pressure, once it falls below the pressure in the aorta, that's when the semilunar valves shut and you get the dub. Lub dub, lub dub. Lub is the closing of the AV valves. Dub is the closing of the semilunar valves. And then you get what's known as the isovolumetric relaxation no change in blood volume. Isovolumetric relaxation. And then it's not until the pressure in the ventricle falls below the pressure in the atria. That's when you get the AV valves to open up again. And you're going to get passive filling. Blood's going to move from the atria to the ventricles. As long as the pressure in the atria is higher than the pressure in the ventricles, you're going to get passive filling. And you can see the volume increases during passive filling. And then it starts all over again. Okay, question. Did you have a question? No, no. Okay, questions? Cardiac cycle. The type of questions that I would ask is, um, what valves are open during this phase right here, the isovolumetric phase? What valves are open? you should be able to say no valves, right? That's when all the valves are shut. Okay, so take a look at this at home. Uh, on Monday, I'll give you some questions. We'll talk about this on the review session on Friday too. Again, this is known as the Wiggers diagram. And now it's actually much easier to go through the cardiac cycle, right? Systole, you have the isovolumetric phase at the top here, and you have the ejection phase. And this tells you what's happening with the valves. And then diastole, you actually have the isovolumetric relaxation and then passive filling. This is going to be when the atria are um, relaxed and then when the atria contract. And you have passive filling until the atria both contract, which propels that last bit of blood into the ventricles. And then again, there's an animation, but this is kind of giving you the different phases as well. So it's much easier to understand. Uh, we concentrated on, again, the left side of the heart only because there's greater pressure changes, but the same thing is happening on the right side of the heart as well. So again, the two ventricles contract simultaneously, but the left ventricle contracts more forcefully because it has to work against a higher resistance to develop higher pressure. The resistance in the pulmonary systemic circulation is low due to the high capillary density in parallel to each other. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the vasculature. And then there's an animation that's posted on your website if you want to take a look at that at home. So a few more terms that I just wanted to review before we go on. I think you'll appreciate this with the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, cardiac output, again, is the amount of blood 
and that's uh, a unit of volume, the amount of blood that the heart pumps per unit time, usually expressed in mils per minute. Stroke volume is the amount of blood the heart pumps with each beat. Heart rate is the rate of contraction, and remember cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. We talked about this as well, Car uh, bradycardia decreases, is a decrease in heart rate, and tachycardia is an increase in heart rate. Technically, bradycardia is a resting heart rate of less than 40 beats per minute. Tachycardia is a resting heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute. Um, can you repeat the last two? Yeah. So bradycardia is an abnormal slowing of the heart at rest. Bradycardia is technically a resting heart rate of less than 40 beats per minute. Tachycardia is a resting heart rate of greater than 100 beats per minute. Now, one thing that I just wanted to show you as well, um, part of your, your um, essential cardiovascular equation was to actually calculate heart rate with the R to R value. When we started this, I just gave you 75 beats per minute. But this is how you would calculate it if you were given the R to R value. Remember, this is P, Q, R, S, and T. P, Q, R, S, and T. Just remember, P is atrial depolarization. Q, R, S is ventricular depolarization and the T wave is ventricular repolarization. This is the R to R value. R to R interval. So if this interval is 800 milliseconds, we can also write that as 0 0.8 seconds. And what you can say is heart rate, if you know the R to R value, is equal to beats per minute. This would be one beat per 0 0.8 seconds. And then you can multiply that by one, that would be 60 seconds per one minute. So first take one and divide it by 0.8 and then multiply that by 60 seconds. You should get 1.25 beats per second and then you multiply that by 60 seconds, right? 75 seconds cancels out, 75 beats per minute, right? Heart rate. I just gave you 75, but that's how you would actually calculate it. All right, so pulling it all together, pulling it all together. Uh, if I gave you an R to R value, you should be able to calculate heart rate. If I gave you the systolic pressure and diastolic pressure, you should be able to calculate mean arterial pressure. Okay, let's write this down too. This is gonna get confusing. So from the R to R value, you should be able to calculate heart rate. Stroke volume, what would you need for stroke volume? You would need 
the uh, end diastolic volume and ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood that's ejected, that would be able you would be able to calculate stroke volume. If you knew heart rate and stroke volume, then you would be able to calculate cardiac output. And then if you knew the systolic pressure and diastolic pressure, then you should be able to calculate mean arterial pressure. So if you know mean arterial pressure and cardiac output, you should be able to calculate total peripheral resistance, Ohm's law. Again, we'll keep reviewing this. We'll have some time on Monday to kind of review it as well. I think you'll be able to, it'll get easier and easier. Yeah, question. Are these the questions that we should have made? Um, I would, yes, uh, Ohm's Law, I've said before, is good walking around knowledge. I said that before, so I do want you to memorize mean arterial pressure is equal to cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. I'm not going to give you cardiac output either. You should know that cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. There is an equation sheet that will be given to you for exam two. It's already online if you want to take a look at that e equation sheet. Okay, so I have five more minutes. I do want to talk about this particular phenomenon. Again, you have all the tools for this one to really understand it. What I want you to notice with this particular figure is that as you increase ventricular end diastolic volume, this is the amount of blood that you force into the ventricle during diastole. So the more blood that you force into the ventricle, you can see that the greater the stroke volume, right? You get a more forceful contraction that gives you a, an increase in stroke volume. So why is that? Let's take a look at the top here. This is actually called the Frank Starling mechanism or the Frank Starling effect. This is all about the length tension relationship. We've talked about this before. I just want to make sure that you have this formal understanding of it. The Frank Starling effect says that as you increase the end diastolic volume, the amount of blood that you force into that ventricle you stretch the cardiac muscle towards optimal length so that you can get a more forceful contraction to accommodate that extra amount of blood that's returned to the heart. Okay, so if asked about this on an exam, this is the length tension relationship. It's not the other ones, it's not the intensity force, frequency force, or load velocity. It is the length tension relationship. You'll also notice that the level of sympathetic tone, sympathetic nervous system activity, shifts this curve, right, uh, upward. So you get an even more forceful contraction with sympathetic, an increase in sympathetic tone. So why is that? You can actually see that here too. This is normal. This green line is the Frank Starling effect. You stretch that muscle towards LO when you force more blood into the ventricle. But the orange line is an increase in contractility, the forcefulness of the contraction as well, with sympathetic <coughs> stimulation. Now, this is a crazy slide. Okay, this is actually telling you again, sympathetic stimulation is GS coupled. You get an increase in cyclic AMP and an increase in the activity of PKA. The only thing that I really want you to know is that it increases, it tightens up those elastic elements, 
tightens up the tighten here so that you get a more forceful contraction with sympathetic nervous system activity. When you increase, you, you stretch out those elastic elements, you're gonna get a increase in stroke volume and an increase in cardiac output as well as heart rate. It also has effects on the circa pump so that you get a faster relaxation. You get, and this is what it looks like. You get an increase in the forcefulness of the contraction and a faster relaxation with sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Whew, that was a dense lecture, you all. I actually did record it. I think that there was a lot of, um, you knew a lot of the foundational stuff for this. We will review this again on Friday and Monday. All right? All right, I will see you then.